Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of Gaming Weekly. Yeah, this week we've got Kingdom Hearts. We did it! We made, we survived Logan Paul and the Tide Pod Challenge just to get to this Ooh. moment right yes. here. Take a second and congratulate yourselves on living through our generation's Great Depression. <laughs> Good job everybody, uh -oh. 12 did we years, make it? 17 yeah. years, 28 years. 28 years. Since Kingdom Hearts 2, wow. But much like the weather outside, there are still rainy days in gaming. Anthem's VIP demo was really more of a really unstable beta test that we actually charged people to play because of EA. Mm. That hurts. Plus, Metro Exodus is going to be uh, an Epic Game Store exclusive. More shots fired from the house to Fortnite built. Get it? Building on solo Fortnite pun for you guys. Enjoy that one. <laughs> that was a real, really good pun. A lot of loved it. Uh, and we've got some smaller updates on stuff we spoke about last week, like Dreams and Resident Evil 2. But first things first, the quote unquote demo of Anthem was for some people completely unplayable. Uh, there's a bug to give people infinite load times, which is to me. the best length of load time. So yeah. major rubber banding issues, your javelins just hiccuping all over the screen. Yeah. Uh, there were bugs tied to unlocks, happened to me. <laughs> Client bugs, which I'm not exactly sure what those, they probably happened to me. Uh, basically <laughs> everything you don't want to have wrong with your game two weeks before the thing actually comes out. Yeah, and that's not even our biggest issue, which should have been our biggest issue. What, you had to pay for this broken mess. You can only access it if you pre-ordered the game or if you're regularly paying EA access subscriber. That means you're paying a subscription fee to get access to something so messy some of those paying subscribers couldn't even get access to it. Ironic when it's called EA Access. Ooh, we hit capacity. <laughs> we oversold this digital thing. Yeah, uh, I know. Uh, and then they want to call it a VIP demo. Uh, boy, that's the most broken demo and doesn't make anyone feel like a very important player. That's yeah. what I'm going to go for it. But okay, so there's there's angles to this, right? Uh, Alana, we can't really fault Bioware for this, maybe? This was definitely EA's call. I would imagine Bioware was like, bad idea. Game's not ready to be called demo. This isn't a real slice, which is stress <laughs> testing. Then people are really mad at Bioware for it, and that sucks. But yeah, I, I would 100% blame EA. It's them just trying to push Origin and access amidst the Epic Games versus Steam war that's happening right now. Hmm, that's true. I didn't think about mm. that. Games as a service, baby. Yeah, the developers did actually release a statement about the content of the game, though. So, hey, Game Zone, what'd they say? Weirdly, Really early on in their message, they started out by saying our war rooms in both locations were hotbeds of activity 24-7 all three days, which seems like bragging about crunch for a demo. <laughs> it doesn't work. Guys, we worked so hard. It's still broken. We don't care. But yeah. we we worked all night. Yeah, it's not a great look, uh, but I guess I appreciate those people working hard. Thank you. Sure. I'm sorry that you work for EA today. Why not? <laughs> uh, they then went on to talk about how they're doing more scale testing to be ready for the next beta on Friday or today if you're watching us on YouTube but also wanted people to know that the demo actually wasn't a slice of the full game, as what? the word demo would imply. Very much backtracking here. Basically, they said there's a ton of stuff they've already done for the full launch that won't even make the public demo weekend, including weapons with 0% infusions, party gather issues, javelin unlock behaviors, fixes for players losing XP, me. general performance improvements, general stability fixes, and a few thousand more things. Jesus. Yeah. Apparently. Um, so to me, this seems like a titling issue and an exclusivity issue. Don't make people pay to stress test your servers and don't call it a demo when they are. It's just super gross. Yeah. However, I actually do like Anthem. Oh. Boo. I played it back at E3. Chill. Shell! <laughs> it was one of the games that really stuck out to me because it's just super fun. Uh, I know you played a ton of it, Bruce. What did I did. I, I played like six, seven hours of it, and that was all those bugs happened to me over and over and over. And I would crash out. And I was trying to get James to play with me, and he crashed out. He had to repair his hard drive. Corrupt my hard drive. Corrupted his hard drive. Oh. He, had to, he, he had to do a check disc on it. But once I got into the game, it was really fun. I actually really enjoyed it. Just like Destiny, you get in, yeah. you get gear, you, you have abilities. Yeah, I mean, like, and you're the uh, there's this thing called a stronghold there, and the stronghold's like the big boss that okay. comes out, and you all have to shoot the big boss, and there's ads and stuff like that. Glowing points. Really fun. It has glowing points. It was. I, I thought it was fun. I mean, like, I actually really enjoyed the game once I got into it. But holy shit, man! If I hadn't been streaming that game, I would have been out. Yeah. I would have been like, okay, this is crashing me seven times. I'm not playing this anymore. Yeah. So, but I, I mean, I, hopefully, I when it does come out, it will be more fun to play, but or, or playable in general. But I mean, I, I really like the flying. And, and the world is huge too, there's tons of verticality. They have just loads of places that you can dive into, so your javelin heats up or can overheat, and if you dive into water or fly under a waterfall, it'll it cool you off, down. And yeah. I really like that mechanic. It just makes traversal more fun and you have to be did thinking you go, about did it. Did you go underwater? Yeah. Going underwater is really scary and kind of claustrophobic, so it's, it's pretty neat, but that's yeah. part of the game, because it, it, you do feel like you're flying around in a totally open world. Uh, in Anthem, and it's beautiful. It, it, is, yeah. it is gorgeous. Yeah, we don't know that much about the lore yet, except that it was supposedly like a world that was built by the gods, and then they stopped halfway for some reason. Oh. That's what the story of that universe is. So there's is, a so. fantastic element 
of unexplained things that they can drag on forever in a science fiction setting. So they can Perfect. Just like Destiny. Yeah. Well, it's like everything. <laughs> yeah. It's everything. I know. It's, uh, they have, like a, that's storytelling. I know. There's a playbook here. James, can I ask specifically what happened to your hard drive? Like what? <laughs> I what, got the what loading bug. So uh -huh. it basically never stopped loading, and then it wouldn't let me, it took over my computer, so I wasn't even able to end task the, the process or anything, and yeah. then basically had to hard reset my computer, and when I came back, the, I couldn't access my D drive, and then I had to run check disk on the whole thing, and then it, it found errors and had to repair those errors, and then. That's just bad develop, like, that shouldn't happen anymore. Yeah, no, I know. Unless... Also, that's probably gonna be our headline. <laughs> it literally <laughs> broke your computer. Yeah. And then destroys what? computers. <laughs> I, it did the same to me, actually, because I was trying to, I was trying to turn it up to, like, unlimited frames, basically, because I was like, I got 144 Hell frames, yeah. let's try it. And it shut down my computer Ooh. and it broke another computer that it was connected to. <laughs> oh my and God. I was, like, I was like, oh boy. So I restarted everything and then I fired it back up and it worked. And I was like, okay. Oh. <laughs> I, I have a pretty okay computer too. And I only got as far as the hub world and it ran like garbage on medium settings at 720 for me. So. Do we oh think this is a game being broken situation or a crisis situation where the game is just so think, pretty that you have to have like an both. excellent PC? I think it's I think it's both. I think that demo was totally broken. No. And then also it required a lot of processing power and graphics power yeah. to run the game. Because so. it is pretty. So not optimized, but it's coming out real soon. Three real weeks. soon. Three weeks. That's like the, way... the February twenty second, I want to okay, say. Okay, well game technically to be in that it depends because it's doing the same thing that Battlefield did, where it's like you can get oh, the right. Oh, it's open the beta, lower, or yeah. you you get it right. tw twenty four hours early, or whatever. There's like five release schedules on it's different the worst. platforms. It's terrible. It is the worst. Yay! Come on. All right. It's also just worth considering that online games so rarely launch without any issues. Some bugs are so hard for testers to find and replicate. There's virtually nothing you can do but let players find them for you. Well, your your computer's exploded. That wasn't that hard that's to bad. find. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> It might not be possible to launch a game without a bunch of hiccups at this point. I mean, let's not forget, making games is really fucking hard, yeah. and that's why we don't do it. Yeah, we sure. just complain about them. That's a lot easier to do and makes us look cool. Uh -huh. Still, Yeah, still it's pretty gray. On one hand, they're making us pay for it. On the mm -hmm. other hand, we don't gain anything by tempering expectations, especially when so many online games have rocky launches to begin. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's tough to say. It's like, okay, on one hand, maybe these games cannot be made without this phase, this online phase where everything's broken and weird. But you're accepting money for it. And if you're accepting money for it, then you owe it, you owe people that. Yeah, you do. That's what you no, said you you're gonna pay for it. So yeah. I don't know. No, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I, I it was, It's weird, because I could see both sides, but also when, like Alana said, when EA or whoever forced it to call it a VIP demo that you're paying for, that I paid for, and then you get in and it crashes over and over and breaks things, <laughs> That's, I think that's inexcusable, honestly. I think we can draw the line there. I almost feel like that should be illegal, and it probably is in some countries. It probably is somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and it should be It should be inexcusable. They legally should have to issue refunds. Well, I guess all they all they would have to do in their terms of service is say, we make no guarantees about the operability of this in the launch I'm window. Sure, which I'm sure they did. It would definitely violate consumer rights laws in Australia, for sure. Yeah. Well, if something is broken, you have to get it. But they paid for it. That's the thing. I suppose you could what argue you that, like, what is description? You, you paid for, for the subscription service for access to the EA vault. <laughs> yeah. This is just a little freebie. This is we what all the lawyers are doing in EA yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> what do you guys think? Does Anthem get a pass since it hasn't technically launched yet? Does Bioware have a responsibility to make sure the thing is at least functional before accepting any money to access it? Let us know in the comments. Lawrence will make a graph about it. Uh, you know I love those graphs. <laughs> Tune in next week for some graphs. All right, moving on to the next juicy controversy. PC gamers are mad again. <laughs> I was already mad. <laughs> uh, their five grand gaming PC dropped a frame three hours into Resident Evil 2, didn't no, it? Yeah, well, I mean, yes, that did happen. And it, it fucked Capcom, I'm coming for you. No, this one's more legitimate even though that's still also legitimate. Yeah. And it represents a growing <laughs> conflict in the PC marketplace. Yeah, and to make it worse, there's not really a bad guy in this story. Well, maybe there is, it's kind of tricky. Yeah, okay, so let's talk about it. So last Monday, January 28th, Deep Silver announced that the upcoming Metro Exodus would exclusively be sold on the recently announced and launched Epic Game Store, mm. joining other exclusives like Hades and The Division 2. This is on PC, by the way. Yeah, given that the game has already been available to pre-order on Steam for a while now, this gets messy. Yeah, wild. So the reasoning behind this is, Pretty obvious, Epic Store offers a better revenue split than Steam does, meaning publishers take home more of the 60 bucks you throw down. Also, Epic seems real motivated to secure exclusives for its platform lately, probably offering some promotional space, yep. sweetheart deals, maybe even some money. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of, there's a lot of like, sign exclusive with us, we'll get you front page banner placement, and you don't have to fight hordes of hentai games on Steam. Yeah, you guys have seen this before, greedy companies jerking us gamers around, <laughs> making us register for garbage services, gamer mad! <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, no, yeah, not so fast. Okay, Deep Silver's right, actually right. doing us kind of a solid here. 
pricing the game at $50 on Epic's Game Store to pass on the savings to the players, according to Deep Silver CEO Dr. Clemens Kondratis. Is that a real name or fake? I mean, it was <laughs> it's a Bond villain. <laughs> He's a, yeah, exactly, he's a Bond villain. That's actually pretty cool. When's the last time a company could have made more money but chose not to as a solid of their player base? Yeah, it's neat, but also let's not roll over so fast. Deep Silver's still coming out ahead with the price cut. So 70% yeah. of $60 is 42 bucks. Yeah. 88%, which is that Epic's revenue share, yeah. of $50 is 44. So even after cutting the price, they're still taking two more dollars. I mean, to me, it sounds like a win-win. Consumers win and they win. Do consumers win though? That's, I mean, I, it's, I don't know. Ah, 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 Dr. Clemens strikes again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that Dr. He, he got, got us again. He got us. Uh, on top of that, it's not like people that pre-ordered the game get that price cut either. If you bought yeah. the game before Monday, you paid 60 bucks. Uh, if you buy it now though, you pay $50. <laughs> there doesn't seem to be any plan to price adjust for early adopters either, which kind of sucks. They should give a refund or something, right? Something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. maybe like a, you get a little epic game gun and that. I don't know. Yeah, sure. Uh, Steam seems to lean into that notion too, uh, posting a notice on the store page for Metro Exodus saying that, quote, we think the decision to remove the game is unfair to Steam customers, especially after a long pre-sale period, which is true and also kind of weird for yeah. Steam to kind of be shading off a little bit like that. No, that's true. Uh, in return, Steam users reacted in classic fashion by review bombing previous entries in, this, in the game, like Metro 2033 and Metro Last Light. Uh, Alana, what happened with that negative swarm? Mm. So basically, the series' original author, whose name I am not going to pronounce, posted D Dimitri Grakowski. Grakowski. He's another Bond villain. Ha, ha, ha. Together, we will rule the world! Yeah, Dimitri got a skin! <laughs> he posted a gram January 30th saying, apparently the steam was not enough for our steam train. English uh, is his second language. He's Russian, all right? All right, yeah, he burned Yeah, it. he was also making a pun. It's fine, I respect it. Uh, <laughs> comments flooded the post complaining about the switch, to which Glukovsky replied yeah. that he is not responsible for the publisher's business decisions, that Epic will help, will everything to help. He's getting there. Will do everything to help, yeah. and that he did not have an impression that Steam gives a shit. Well, he said that, did gives not have shit. an impression that Steam gives shit. Gives shit. Do not impression <laughs> Steam gives shit. I do not have impression that Steam gives shit. There you go, yeah, you got it, Glukovsky. Epic will everything to help. Uh, <laughs> God bless you. Interestingly, Was some that was... offensive? <laughs> <laughs> no, was, they're the bad guys. Cool. <laughs> uh, some websites reported that Glukovsky stated he was standing by and watching my franchise being killed, but we couldn't find any trace of that particular comment, not even a screenshot. Did Glukovsky delete an angry comment? Or are gamers so mad they're doctoring Instagram replies? <laughs> Who knows, but it's a sign of how messy this is getting. Yeah, there's some mad people out there. So finally, the exclusivity deal between Deep Silver and Epic doesn't last forever. Oh. The publisher announced that Metro Exodus will, quote, return to Steam and on other storefronts after 14th of February in 2020. So in a year. Yeah. So, so if you want to, yeah, you want to buy it on Steam, you got to wait a year. And buy it again? Why would you do that? Yeah, it's a weird situation. On one hand, you have a lot of people that put down good money for a service they're used to on Steam. Yeah. It doesn't seem fair that a publisher can just switch it after they've already accepted money for a product. The implication being that you will experience it through this network and tools that you're familiar with. Yeah, on the other hand, there's no way that Deep Silver could have known the Epic Store would pop into being like it did. That's true. It's hard to fault them for negotiating with different partners to find a more profitable agreement, especially when they're theoretically doing the right thing and giving us a price cut in the meantime. Yeah. Well, the Epic Epic could have, in theory, even offered them a deal in the yeah. same way that it works for consoles, right? Yeah. Like, in theory, they could have been like, we will give you this money to come to our platform. You'll make it back. Like, we don't know the inner workings of that deal. Absolutely. Other, it could have been more than just that, uh, what is it, 88%. It probably is. Yeah. Because yeah. there's exclusivity involved. And there's no way that Deep Silver would say, yeah, we'll shut down and, and f like fuck over all the people who pre-ordered on Steam for no reason. That sounds like a good deal. Yeah. No, they got something in return. I'm gonna guess promotion. Uh, usually that's the like invisible handshake that happens, but Deep Silver should find a way to make up that $10 disparity. This is what I actually, I yeah. definitely agree with. Between the old Steam price and the new Epic Game Store price to the people who already paid. Anyone that already pre-ordered the game is clearly way more invested in the series than people who will pick it up now. So wouldn't you want to show them a little acknowledgement instead of sticking them with a higher price and a platform change, then shrugging about it? What you gonna do? I mean, you gotta give them something. They've communicated well so far. Uh, I think that they, they did the price cut, which I think shows good intention. Yeah. The one thing, yeah, that I have yet to see them really acknowledge or try to deal with is that $10 price difference. Maybe they're trying to figure out plans right now. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's tough to figure out where to stand on this unless you pre-order the game on Steam, then it's pretty easy, that sucks. Yeah, but aside from that, this is the most concrete benefit to platform competition we've seen so far games dropping in price, which is a big deal. Yeah. It's a really big deal. A lot of people have said for a long time that digital distribution saves so much money. 
Uh, it's the cost of goods, it's cost of advertising and store, it's shipping, it's everything. They just get to take that money back. Yeah. And a lot of people have rightly said, well, how come we are still paying the same price? Shouldn't we You've get You've been like swindled, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Got us. How do you guys feel about this? Uh, leave a comment, Lawrence will dig through and make a pie chart just like he did with the other ones. Loves those charts and graphs. Yeah, chart corner. <laughs> Here we go. Got to dig through YouTube comments all night. It's going to be fun. Kingdom Hearts 3. Oh, oh, yeah. Almost everyone in our office is playing it. Uh, almost everyone really likes it, although yeah. it's com completely nonsensical. Obviously, yeah. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of passe at this point to make fun of Kingdom Hearts 3's story. But holy shit, does Kingdom Hearts 3 go in some really dumbass directions? Anyway, sorry. Passe? Are you sure about that? I can make fun of it for days and days. <laughs> Everyone's I'm not over it yet. It. Let's keep making fun of it. It's oh, yeah, yeah. Let's. I'd like to keep making fun of it a lot. It's hard to talk about it without spoilers, because spoilers shouldn't matter for something like Kingdom Hearts 3, but... So, okay. So, uh -huh. all right. yeah, yeah. So they have they have mechanics inside of Kingdom Hearts to like separate people's hearts and bodies, and those become separate characters. They become nobodies. And well, that's different, but yes. Yeah. Uh, and then the hearts can go inside of other people and split and reconnect. So like, not only does Kingdom Hearts have no grounded basis of what a character is, but also Kingdom Hearts three introduces a new way to like copy people. So there's there's like copies of worlds have and I not copies of to that yet. You may not have gotten to that yet. No, no, I've only played like six hours. Of it. That's uh, that's like Frozen Land territory revelations. Oh, oh okay, there. no, so I haven't gotten to that yet. They talk about it in Toy Story. They do. You're right. Yeah. Oh, they do. That's true. Yeah. They start they start mentioning it in Toy Box. I think the contained stories within the worlds are kind of cool. Like because each world kind of has its own little story, sure. and those are easy to follow and fun and nice and happy. So those are fine. The overall story, just I don't. Well, that's because like it. people like Ansem and Zehan Art and whatever, they just keep appearing, mm. which yeah. really takes we'll, you out of the game. We'll just manifest, talk some shit, and then disappear again. <laughs> I know it's just not fair. I think it's like to the, to your point. I think that Kingdom Hearts Three is in a weird spot in in terms of like rights management. Yeah. Because there's no uh, Final Fantasy characters in it anymore at all. Oh. They mentioned three of them, and that's it. Uh, and then also, you don't see a lot of interaction between Disney characters and Kingdom Hearts characters no, you anymore. Don't. Yeah. Usually, Sora, Donald, and Goofy are just kind of watching the movie happen, <laughs> and then the characters leave, and then an Organization 13 member just yes, warps in. That's true. They talk nonsensically, and then the cutscene's over. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much every cutscene. So it's it's weird. I feel like Disney's sort of pulling back on letting their characters interact outside of their normal bubbles anymore. And you can kind of see it in this game. Maybe I'm reading into it too much. So how do we feel about gameplay, though? That's a really good question because at first you're just like, oh, you just press A over and on over. But then you see like big dialogue boxes that keep popping. That's like you press A, then X, then right bumper, then left bumper, then left bumper, then right bumper. And you're like, what the fuck? And you close it and you press A. Uh, I mean, that's all you do. You press A until you build up that meter, and then you can press Y, and mm -hmm. you get a pirate ship. Yeah. <laughs> that, know, like, that, I just randomly have insane abilities that seem to come out of nowhere. I'm like, cool, I didn't know what that was going to do, but that was sick, I guess. At one point, I turned into fireworks. Yeah. Like, all right. Yeah. Don't that's know true. where it came from. What frustrates me a little bit as a, as a hard hardcore gamer. I would agree. Kingdom Hearts 3 is actually pretty easy. They made this game, like, because like you were talking about, you match A, then you hit Y, and a bunch of sparklies happen and everything dies. I love it. But Kingdom Hearts 3, I've, I've cruised through it so far. How many hours have you played? Uh, me? Yeah. I'm like 25 hours in. Okay, and it's still easy. Yeah. That's great. It's, I can't, I'm looking forward to it. Are you, what difficulty are you playing on? Proud. Okay, yeah. I was waiting for the dumb term to describe hard. <laughs> yeah. Of it's course not, he's playing on proud. It's not critical mode. Look at it, you see the, the thing he did? Yeah. He did this. <laughs> it feels like an old game, it really does. Yeah, I, it I does. feel like it kind of feels like a Lego game that isn't written as well, <laughs> like a little bit. It just plays so easily, but we're mostly talking about negatives here, so what do you guys really like about it? God, it looks amazing. I, I can't wrap my head around how good it looks. Does the cutscenes are so fucking incredible looking. Yeah, I guess I guess they look good. The they animation just look, they just look animated. They just look animated. Well, that's that's beautiful. Okay, I, all right, yeah, sure. All right, the, the it looks as good is, as the movies do. The bar is Disney animation. Yeah. yeah. So like, I don't know. Fro like Frozen Land looks incredible, and they spoilers have the whole let it go in there with like cutaways to Sora being like, uh. <laughs> but. Like, when she stomps and makes her ice castle, it looks fucking phenomenal. So, like, the tech behind this game is ridiculous. And just, like, some of the special effects and the ride summons, they all look no, incredible. The ride summons are amazing. I, that's what I was, I was going to say. A positive for me is that the barrier to entry is very low on this game, so that I, it's easy. Yeah. Like, when you walk in and everyone, like, if, 
Lawrence, people like Lawrence bitch about it being easy, but I love that it's easy because then I can just be like, oh cool, I'll just press A and then I got a sweet roller coaster that's blasting through enemies and stuff and, and it looks amazing. I'm yeah. very much enjoying playing it at the same time that I'm playing Resident Evil 2 because Resident Evil 2 is almost sadistically hard. Oh, yeah, it's a real gamer's game right there. It is, it's really difficult. You can shoot a zombie in the head seven times and it'll still get up. It's oh. just, it's so hard. And then that compared to a game where I just tap A for a bit and everyone's really happy and there's beautiful music is like, okay, it's a good palate cleanser. I feel good about it. <laughs> Oh, that's true, you're right. So to wrap up some stuff we talked about last week, the Dreams beta has uh, lifted its NDA. Woo! Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're confused as to why this weird and wonderful PlayStation game is keeping its weirdness a secret, but not anymore. Yeah. Cool. And Woo! boy, it looks it looks wacky. I was expecting like Little Big Planet, like glowy blobs and stuff, and like, oh, I made a little airplane game, but it sucks. Uh, the stuff from Dreams actually looks really yeah. cool. And I can really talk about good. Dreams forever, it's so legit. Yeah. Uh, plus, some people were angry at Alana for saying Resident Evil 2's campaign is short. Alana, defend yourself. Why were you so dumb? <laughs> Let it be known that I wrote that insult to myself. You did, you did. Say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so I said I didn't finish all the campaigns, and I hadn't. <laughs> but basically there are four of them, and I wish the individual ones were longer. So I was basically saying that I think it's too short, and I still think that. Uh, you can finish each individual campaign in five or six hours. If you know where everything is, it's less than that. There are people finishing it in an hour at this point. Um, so sure, in theory, that's 20 hours in total, but since none of the playthroughs are dramatically different, it's not like Nier Automata, where some of the playthroughs feel like a sequel to the first ones. I just was saying that I wish they all individually were longer or used the spaces that you're in for more yeah. time, I guess. Um, but I could have totally been clearer on that. Uh, I think people thought I was saying I was only counting one campaign and thus the value isn't there, but that's not what I meant. You can absolutely get 20 hours out of the game, probably more, it's for sure replayable, different modes add different enemies and stuff. Um, shout out to Tofu, which is really cool. Oh, you I just, Tofu? Yeah. Oh. I just wish that they, they were all longer. That's basically what Makes I'm sense. Yeah. Speaking of Resident Evil 2, turns out it sold extremely well. It shipped 3 million copies in the first week. Hell yeah. Resident Evil 7 didn't even sell that well. <sighs> Pretty good. What a weird landscape we're in, man. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm down. I, I want Capcom to do well. I think, I think you know, despite maybe the, some of the Street Fighter woes, they've always been trying real hard. Look, I have some beefs with Capcom. Uh, they have a habit of releasing a game and then releasing the same game a year later for the same price, and that right. makes me mad. Squeeze that juice. Squeeze <laughs> well, it. Like, they did it with uh, Dragon's Dogma and then Dark Arisen and then MVC3 and MVC3 Ultimate. Same game, tiny little bit more content, exact same price. And we're like, that's not cool, Capcom. Why are we not calling you out on that? But if they just keep remaking Resident Evils with that money, Keep well, doing it. Their games don't sell well enough for them to not sell them multiple times. I guess. I Dragon's Dogma well. didn't really clear a lot of money the first game. It's incredible, go. everyone buy it. Dragon's Dogma's great. Uh, to compare that with other franchises for sales numbers, Assassin's Creed Origins sold 1.5 million in its first week. Shipped and sold are different quantifiers, but still, Origins was a new game from an ever popular, arguably more current franchise. Yeah. Far Cry 5 hit 2.5 million in its first week. Monster Hunter World was 2.45 million. Basically, Resident Evil 2 is killing it. Yeah, it really is. That's another that's a zombie pun. It's a nice job. So much so that if fans demand it, which they have, Capcom said they might consider remaking Resident Evil 3. Another game I yeah, won't buy. Boy, people love Mr. X, don't they? <laughs> what about Mr. X, but for the whole game? Nemesis is going to be great. <laughs> Everyone's complaining about Mr. X now. I don't what? really see Resident Evil. What? He's like my favorite part of the whole game. Oh, I, there are a lot of posts saying Mr. X ruins the game. Uh oh. I love it. People him. are gonna yell at Alana again. People are gonna yell at Alana. Oh no, did I make another bad opinion? <laughs> Can't wrong think here. Uh, and that'll do it for this week's episode of Gaming Weekly. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next week. Get all those hidden emblems. Final Fantasy VII, you cowards. <laughs> That's right, yeah, seriously. Where the hell is that game? We've put a hidden emblem somewhere in this episode. Scan it with your gummy phone. There's one huge issue that I have not seen, that most people have not uh, picked up, that I, I definitely have the biggest issue. It's not Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, the best Resident Evil, right, James? Nah. Okay. <laughs> Didn't even get his support on that one. No. <laughs> he, he, nobody's support. No. I don't even know what he's talking about. I just didn't like the tube top. She runs around the whole game in a tube top. You get unlockable 